Okay, gentlemen, let me have your attention for a second. It is now time for our afternoon chapel service that we have Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Our chapel guest this afternoon is Brother James Williams, and I know he'll be obedient to the Lord and give you a good word. Now, a couple things. You have two options. You can either attend the service, or if you want, you can leave the building and come back at 4.30. I repeat, you have two choices. You can either attend the service, or if you want, you can leave the building and come back at 4.30. But if you choose to stay in here, I need this room quiet. That means basic everyday respect. No talking, sound off, headphones on all your radios or whatever you got. Don't interrupt the service, don't interrupt the preacher. If you got questions, comments, or whatever, hold that till after service. Then feel free to come forward and talk all you want. So we're going to go ahead and uh, turn the service over to Brother James, and I'll bring everybody in from the courtyard. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good evening, gentlemen. I love you guys so much. I'm so honored and privileged to be here. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the entire world but to be here with you guys. It's such an honor. I love you guys so much. Okay, I want to first start out with a couple of reasons why we need to respect the Bible. There's 66 books in here in the Old and New Testament. The Bible is the best-selling book of all time in the history of the world. The Bible is the most attacked book in the history of the world, and it's obviously still survived. It's here. The movie Jesus that was uh, filmed in 1973 is the most popular movie of all time, translated into 1,600 different languages. Jesus is the most popular person in the history of the world. In Christianity, the story of the Bible is the only God, true God, but the only God that we can be reconciled to. That he put his son on the cross and a man as Jesus that knew no sin became sin to satisfy the wrath of his father and so that we can be his righteousness before him and we can stand before God because we've lived a life that honors God by trying to be the hands and feet of his son Jesus Christ and God respects that. There are a couple of ways that we know that we're Christians and that we're doing the right thing and that we know that we're saved and we're going to go to heaven one day when the Lord calls us and the first thing is we're remorseful of our sin we're, we're, uh, we're remorseful for, our, for other people's sin as well and we're broken hearted people and we're we, the work we do we do in tears because we are constantly reminded of the place we were before we were saved, before we knew we were Christians, before we knew the Father, before we had a relationship with the Son, before we were guided and protected and gifted by the Holy Spirit to give us all the promises of the Bible, we knew the darkness that was there. And it's still there for the people that haven't gotten there. And that's the reason why we're remorseful for other people's sins and our own sin. And I can tell you that I recall a lot of the things I did, and I'm terribly sorry for it. I'm not regretful for it, but before I was saved, I was regretful. But I've been forgiven of my sin, so I'm not regretful of my sin because my sin has been abolished and wiped away and cleaned because I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. We're also called into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're also called into a relationship with community and church. And like I was saying earlier, we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? We want to share the word. Like we know that we were once in the darkness and we're not in the darkness anymore. We want to make sure that the people that were where we were before get out of there and come to the light. And so we want to share the word. We have a passion. You know, all people that come to Christ are called to be preachers and evangelists. It is our duty to be the disciples of God through his son, Jesus Christ, and to tell people all the time. And, you know, I'm on the phone sometimes and, you know, checking you know, whatever the status of the shipment or something, I'll tell the lady or the guy on the other line, I'll say, Jesus loves you. You know, I don't always start out that way because I'm, you know, 
wanting to get that in at the, at the very last second, you know, or b before I hung up with the person, I'll say, Jesus loves you. And then I was talking with the lady I was ordering apart for a customer. And uh, we went on a good little talk about Jesus. And uh, she said, well, I know that was the reason why we talked today, so we could share the word together. And uh, that's such a beautiful thing. And even at the gas station, you know, uh, it, it, it's not easy, I'll tell you. And the reason why it's not easy is because you don't know how people are going to receive you. And, and obviously, you know, uh, we don't want to be, you know, a nuisance and a, a problem to people. Although that's not the way we would be, we could be, you know, taken that way. And so it is hard because we want people to, to, to say something and a lot of times they don't. I say it to people all the time and I don't get the response I'd like to get. Occasionally I do and, uh, and, and that, that def definitely makes it worth the wild. And uh, there's a lot of uh, scripture and uh, a lot of parts of the Bible nobody argues with. While you can't argue with the truth, I mean, unless you want to lose. I don't think anybody sets up themselves to say, oh, I'm going to go argue the Bible so I can lose. No, they don't do that. And uh, because, you know, there is a, a little bit of intelligence in us, huh? All right, so I want to start out with a couple of things here. Okay, so... I'm asking you the most important question of your life. Your joy or your sorrow for all eternity depends on your answer. The question is, are you saved? It is not a question of how you are or if you're a church member or how good you are. But are you saved? Are you sure you'll go to heaven when you die? God says in order to go to heaven, you must be born again. In John 3, chapter 3, verse 7, John, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Ye must be born again. In the Bible, God gives us a plan on how to be born again, which means to be saved. His plan is simple. You can be saved today. How, you ask? You must realize you are a sinner, which means to be Okay, you must realize that you're a sinner, for you have sinned, and it comes short the glory of God. That is also in the last book of the 66 in the Bible, Romans, chapter 3, verse 23. Because you are a sinner, you are condemned to death, for the wages of payment of sin is death. Romans, chapter 6, verse 23. This includes eternal separation from God in hell. And that's the whole point of hell. God isn't there. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this is the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. But God loves so much, He gave His only begotten Son to bear your sins and to die in your place. He hath made Him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may be the righteousness of God to Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus had to shed his blood to die, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 7, 17, verse 11. Without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission. A pardon, a remission. That is uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. God commandeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Although we cannot understand how... God said, my sinners, my, God said, my sins and your sins were laid upon Jesus, and he died in our place. He became our substitute. It is true. God cannot lie. My friend, my brother, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repent, another way of saying repent is to turn away from your old self and to walk a new life and there's only light and darkness. So if you turn away from yourself and you walk away, there's only one other place to go. You wouldn't go anywhere in the world. You would go to Jesus Christ, who, who is God in flesh who came to the world to save all of us sinners. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simply believe on him as the one who bore your sins, died in your place, was buried, 
in whom God resurrected. His resurrection powerfully assures that the believer can claim everlasting life when Jesus received as Savior. When you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you do have everlasting life. Now, you might ask me, well, how can I just believe in something and it happens? Okay. I can tell you, a good, I, can, I got a good answer for that, a perfect answer for that. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have lived a life, your life has changed, you're born again. We talked about that up here in John chapter 3, verse 7. We're living a new life. We're living a life that is the life of God's son, Jesus Christ. And God sees everything. He knows everything. And so when you believe in Jesus, you're saved. But that new belief also changes the behavior. That's what's key. That faith, if that faith is genuine, it changes the behavior. You no longer have the will of yourself any longer. You have the will of God's son. And so that changed behavior walks you in a path to the kingdom of God in heaven. And that's glory and righteousness before the Father on the day of judgment. That's how you can just believe in something and be changed and go to heaven. I asked myself that question a lot before I got into all of this. I said, how can I just believe in something and, and I have everlasting life? Because that faith and that belief has changed me and walked me in a path straight to God. Through his son, Jesus Christ. And I've been given all the promises of the Holy Spirit by receiving Jesus. And now I have protection. Because the Bible also promises protection. And that's how you believe. Because the faith changes the person. I just love how that works. See, so if I believe in Jesus Christ or you believe in Jesus Christ, you're saved. That's the doctrine of justification. And then the changed life that the faith causes is the doctrine of just or, or regeneration. And that's where you're born again. And no one can see the kingdom of God if they're not born again. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John chapter 1, verse 12. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Whoever includes you shall be saved means not maybe nor can, but shall be saved. Surely you realize you are a sinner, right? Wherever you are repenting, lift your heart, go to God in prayer. Luke chapter 1, verse 18, chapter 13, the sinner's prayer. God, be merciful to me as a sinner. Just pray. Oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus was my substitute when he died on the cross. I believe his shed blood, death, burial, and resurrection were for me. I now receive him as my savior. I thank you for the forgiveness of my sins, the gift of salvation and everlasting life because of your merciful grace. Amen. Just take God at his word and claim his salvation by faith. Believe and you will be saved. No church, no lodge, no good works can save you. Remember, God does the saving, all of it. God's simple plan for salvation is you are a sinner. Therefore, unless you believe on Jesus who died in your place, you will spend eternity in hell. If you believe on him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, you receive forgiveness for all your sins and his gift of eternal salvation by faith. You say, surely, it cannot be that simple. Yes, it's that simple. It's scriptural. It's God's plan. My friend, believe on Jesus and receive him as your Savior. If his plan is not perfectly clear, read this tract over and over again without laying it down until you understand it. Your soul is worth more than all the world. I love it because that is so true. You know that when a man turns from himself because he's born in sin, so he's already all about himself. So when a man turns from himself and he looks to the Father and he believes in his son, Jesus Christ, he's gifted the Holy Spirit, he has a changed life, he wants to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, he received the Holy Spirit as his guidance, his protection, and all the promises of the Bible are then fulfilled in that person as they walk their Christian life towards Jesus Christ. They start to live a perfect life. And they start heading that way towards God. <laughs> <laughs> 1 
For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 36. But sure, but sure you are saved. Be sure you are saved. If you lose your soul, you miss heaven and lose all. God's power will save you, keep you saved, and enable you to live a victorious Christian life. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye is able to, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. God will never put you in a situation that you cannot handle. That's what that means. That there is salvation and protection when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay, and then also too, you should be baptized as, an, as, an, uh, uh, as a means of obedience. It is required as a Christian to be baptized. Let me read this to you. You should be baptized in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ as a public testimony of your salvation and then unite with the church believing without delay. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Whosoever therefore shall confess, testify of me before men, him I will confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. So you're making a public profession of faith and belief in Jesus Christ when you get baptized. That's the reason why that's required. I will also note that it doesn't have to, you know, you don't have to worry about doing it right away, okay? You know, because you're going to get in a church, you know, you're going to get involved in community. And the Lord will speak to you, you know. He'll, he, you know, His plan is divine. I can't, you know, presume on the way that God works. <laughs> But you take him seriously and he'll walk you to the way you need to do and get the things done that need to be done. In order to believe that salvation is necessary, one first has to believe that there is a brokenness in the world and innately within people. Atheists and skeptics might not believe that there's anything inherently good or bad within us. They might believe instead that people are just people and that each determines their own path. They feel that the path each person chooses is neither wrong nor righteous so long as he or she is acting authentically. Atheists and skeptics might accept concepts of right and wrong as being social constructs for an orderly or just society, but reject the concepts beyond them if there's nothing inherently wrong with people, then there's no need for salvation. The Bible. Human brokenness begins within the first pages of the Bible. First humans, Adam and Eve, close, chose to disobey God. Their poor choices called personal imperfections, which unfortunately resulted in separation from God's perfection. These imperfections steeped deep into the soul of man were passed like a genetic disease to every future generation. The Bible calls this problem sin, and it impacts every single human being who's ever lived. In fact, Christians believe this natural inclination towards self-centered choices are a human condition we're born into as a result of Adam and Eve's original actions. This means that humans, like a person drowning, need help. We can't fix our problem called sin. Like a shattered mirror, no matter how hard we try, we can never perfectly put back all the shards of fragments of our splintered soul. The good news is God wants to help. In fact, God sent His Son Jesus to fix our problem. The Bible says this is how much God loved the world. He gave His only Son, the one and only Son, and this is why. So that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to the trouble of sending His Son merely to point an accusing finger telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. That's John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Those are my two favorite Bible verses. 
John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then John 3, 17, As God did not send his Son to condemn the world, but that they might find life through him. I did paraphrase that because I don't have it sitting in front of me. But that's what that John 3, 17 says. This is salvation and God's great gift to all who believe. We cannot earn it, pray for it. We can do, all, all we can do is accept that Jesus came to earth to put things right again. He came to restore the brokenness within our soul. He came to restore our relationship with God so that we will never be separated again, neither here on earth or in eternity. Once someone makes the decision to believe, they made completely right in God's eyes. Although their past, current, and future sins are forgiven, this isn't without any penance, pay, or steps taken, but simply the gift of grace that comes within a choice to follow Jesus. The Bible teaches that no matter what background someone comes from, all they need to do for, their, for this salvation from the sinful nature of humanity is to believe. How you ever felt like something wasn't right within the world, like something was broken? Have you ever wished there was a solution to the past and hope for the future? What if the answer is actually salvation? Believing that Jesus really did come to fix all that was broken. Life can feel truly overwhelming for someone at times, which is why people so often use prayer or simply put a conversation with God to ask for hope, strength, guidance for circumstances, changes in difficult times. Putting it in God's hands when we're facing any number of obstacles can provide great comfort and peace in a world that we know is out of control. The Bible teaches us that prayer is powerful and effective both in communicating with God and in bringing peace to those who pray. We consider it an honor to be able to talk personally with the God who created us with confidence. He listens and cares. No matter your faith background and whatever the challenges you're facing, we're eager to pray for you, your family members, and any of your loved ones. There's nothing we love more than to present your request to God and pray with you. Are you ready to change your life? Maybe you've been hurt, made some bad choices, or feel lost, and find yourself wondering, what's the point? Well, Jesus knows your pain, and he wants to be there with you through everything you face. You can choose to have a relationship with him to accept his love and grace. It will be the best decision ever made and change your life like nothing else. Man praying in the city landscape. How do I get to know Jesus? Sin breaks our close relationship with God. It causes us to fear God and to try to live our lives outside of His will. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. God is, the, God is on the side and all the people are on the other side and Christ Jesus is between them to bring them together by giving his life for all of mankind. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. God has already done his part to restore our relationship to him. He took the initiative. All right, I'm going to go over a couple other things here. I love you guys. I appreciate your patience, and thank you for listening to me. I just, uh, just want to bring... I'm not saying all of you are in the darkness. Maybe none of you are. It's not, that's not for me to decide. All I want to do is give you the message of hope, and that you, uh, if, you, if you haven't made that confession of faith, and you haven't leaned upon the word of the Lord through the Bible, and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you will. Because it really is the only thing to do. And uh, let me bring up something, too. I remember a couple of times, more than I'd like to admit, maybe, I sat on the mat right here where this podium's at, and I slept here many, many times. 
And uh, there's nothing the matter with ever being here. You know, this is just one step on your journey. And th this, is, this is never a bad thing. Don't ever look at this as a bad thing because this is just, like I said, a step in your journey. And when you look back on this, and I know I do, everything I learned and in, uh, in the growth and, and all the different times I was able to also sit where you're sitting and listen to the word and my ears were perked. And uh, I, I'm sold. I mean, this is the greatest story ever written is the Holy Bible. And I can't find myself really ever getting involved in anything else but the Bible. And, uh, and, and I pretty much have, I keep constantly separating myself from the world because I want to get out of the darkness. I want to get in the light. And so that's why I come to you with this message. Run from the world. Run to Jesus. Get out of the world. We all know what the world is. Anything that does not glorify God and anything that we do that does not go right back to the Lord, that's the world. And so that's a lot about everything, isn't it? We need to pray. We need to get on our hands and knees and look to the Lord and pray and be at the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and say we're sorry and that we give up. God never wants your success. He wants your surrender. Salvation. Salvation is the promise of eternal life through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Saving human beings from sin and its consequences. Separation from God. Salvation is the process of coming back to the Lord. That relationship being renewed. Because we are born in sin. Repentance. I am sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for what other people have done and do. I'm remorseful for my sin. I'm remorseful for other people's sin. I'm remorseful of the sin of the world. Because we know the consequences. We now believe in eternal life through God's Son, Jesus Christ. We know the consequences. You know, it's not, there's no, there's no in between. You know, there's no uh, eternal rest. There's eternal life and there's eternal death. God comes to you in two ways. He comes to you in mercy and he comes to you in justice. You'll always want him to come to you in mercy. You can receive him coming to you in mercy if you receive his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. The three P's. Penalty. Freedom from sin. The second P, power. Being saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. The third P, Jesus is your judge, your advocate, and your jury. Presence. When Jesus is present in your life, he is your judge, your jury, and your advocate. When you stand before his dad, your, God, your, your father, God, you can't lose your case. Because he's the judge, God, but Jesus is going to act on your behalf as your judge, your jury, and your advocate. You know, so you can't lose your case. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, some people are worried about it. But I, I can tell you, the closer you get to the Lord, you're not going to be worried about death at all. You're not. You're not going to care. Because the thing is, is if, if you die here, you got Jesus Christ. And you've got eternal life with His Father. And if you really believe that you're going to receive that when you die, what does it mean to, for you to die? To, di to, to, to die is His game. You know what I mean? So if I, if I die, I'm with the Lord. If I'm alive, He's with me. It's a win-win situation. There's no reason to be afraid. There is a healthy fear let me go over that real quick because this is good. There's a healthy fear. There's fear, the fear I have for God, and I'll tell you, I do have a fear of God. But I have a fear of disobedience. I have a fear that I'm going to disappoint Him. I have a fear that I'm going to make Him sad. Because He will. He will through the Holy Spirit. He will mourn and cry over sin. He will grieve. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about He's my Father. I want to make Him happy. You know, just think about your father. I, my father committed suicide. I don't have much of a relationship with my real father. But it's a good thing because the only real father I got is God. Man's going to let you down every time. We have to give everything to the Lord. And I fear that I will disappoint God and that he won't be happy with me. And that I need to keep continuing, work, continually working on my life and walking towards him through his son Jesus Christ. It's called a filial fear. That is the word, filio fear. It's a healthy, very live, and very, very strong fear. But it's a good, good, good fear. It's a fear that we need to have. It's a fear that we get. When we, see, when we kneel before God through His Son, Jesus Christ, we receive that ability to see God in a different light. It won't be judgment. You know, it won't be striking you down. 
It will be to lift you up and bring you towards himself. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Repentance. A seriousness before God. Like I was saying earlier, a, a mourning of sin. Your own and your, uh, other people's in the world. You're born again. And then you got sanctification. Sanctification is, the God, is God's process of making you holy and righteous every day. So the more and more you're being like his son, which who was sinless, the more you're being cleaned up. And your hands are cleaner. Your soul's cleaner. Your body's cleaner. You can come to the Lord and, 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 and kneel and pray and ask. And, and if you don't have something, it's because you didn't ask. God will give you everything you ask for it according to his word. You know, he's not going to give you the Mercedes Benz, T.J. Yates. He's not going to give you all that other stuff. You know what I mean? He's going to give you what you need to do his purposes. That he set out and pre he, he set out everything you'll ever do before he even designed the world. It's called election. He decided that you would be in his kingdom, that you would serve him through his son, Jesus Christ, for all of eternity. He knew every hair on your head and everything that you would do, all the righteous work you would do, all the sins you would commit, all the iniquity, everything. He knew it all before the foundation of the world. And, and, and also sanctification. That's why I'm here. I want to share the word of God. I want to bring you guys out of the darkness and into the light. Because I know what, it like, what it's like to be there. You know, part of, the, part of the sadness of being lost is you don't know you're lost. And that's why a lot of people may not come to God. I use the word may because I don't, I don't presume on, you know, where people are. But I, I, I would say that some people don't come to God because they don't realize they're lost. And that's why we kneel and we pray and we ask and we need him to come into our life because he'll open up our eyes. Because the God of this age has blinded us to the truth. And that's the truth. Glorification. That's the day that we stand before the Lord. Jesus is there. And we're naked. We are. We have nothing on. We can't hide in anything. Our ego. We can't uh, hide in our pride. We can't hide in our lies. You know, we have to pray all the time to be cleansed of our unhealthiness and our sins and and what makes us human? We need to get out of that. We have to, you know, stand before God and say, I'm sorry. And uh, he will accept your apology. He will, I promise. I'm, I'm, I'm a happy person. And, 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 you know, happiness is an on and off switch. We know that happiness only comes through his son, Jesus Christ. So either we're happy or we're not. It's not, we don't turn that on and off. It's there or it isn't. We want to study the Word. We want to share the Word. We want to read the Bible. And then, oh, listen. I'm jumping the gun a little, but I like doing this. This is so awesome. Does anyone... And this is just a rhetorical question because I'm going to go ahead and answer it for you. So, does anyone know why we're called to be like Jesus? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Because if we be like God's Son who was sinless, we can stand before God one day and say, you know... He's going to ask us every word that came out of our mouths, every action, every uh, reason why we did all this and that. He'll, he'll ask us all that. But what I was going to say, oh man, the devil just loves to steal from me. He just loves to steal from me. But he's not stealing this for me because I got this. So we're called to be like Jesus. Look, he get right back to me. We're called to be like Jesus on earth because guess what? The only way you can be in heaven is to be like God. So you know what that means. We're called to be on, uh, like Jesus on earth. But then when we see God on, glory, uh, on, uh, on the day of glorification, we're going to be called to be like God. And then if we're called to be like God, we can be in heaven. Nobody is in heaven but God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because you've got to be perfect. And all the people that we know of the Bible that are good, honest people and that we know made it to heaven, well, they're resting. Because they're, you know... The Bible says they'll come up, the dead will rise, and then the living, and they'll all come up to the, to the, uh, to the clouds in heaven with uh, Jesus Christ. So you have to be perfect to be in heaven. And so that's why we'll be called to be like Jesus on earth. And then when we stand before God, we'll be called to be like God. And then we can be in heaven. All right, so another quick question, but I'm going to go ahead and answer it. What is the chief end of man? It's to glorify and honor God. And so this is the biggest way that I can tell you you can know if you're saved. 
Is it a desire for you to constantly know God, his word, and his promises, and to help other people? Because basically, that's all you're ever going to do in your whole life. You're going to do that in heaven. You're going to do that here. So if you can't do it here, you're not, can't, you can't do it there. And so that's why the chief end of man is to honor and glorify God. You'll do it here, and you'll do it in all of eternity. You know, because if there's not a purpose in heaven, it's going to get old real quick. You know what I mean? You're only going to like running up and down the gold roads and swinging on the gates of pearl for so long before you go out of your mind. The purpose of God is to glorify, the purpose of heaven is to glorify God through all of eternity. And you know what? We'll never, ever even get to the foothills of understanding the love that God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ. That before he even gave us life here on earth, he knew everything about us. It will take a forever, a forever to understand that. It's an, it's an impossible love in all of eternity. And when we're in heaven, we'll be chasing down those answers and those questions about why did you do this for me, God? Why did you do this for me, God? And then we're just going to have this energy in our souls that is just a fire that will burn forever. And you have to have purpose. And that's what happens. Some, I mean, you, you have to have a fallout to have a change. I mean, that's just, I'll tell you the truth. That's the way it is. You have to have a fallout to have a change. I had a fallout. I had to change. You know, and then if you don't want to change, then, you know what I mean? So, you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's all I can tell you. I, I don't know the other parts of all this. That I just know that when you give your life to Jesus, everything changes. Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we have received the grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth became through Jesus Christ. So in Moses, we live by the law. In Jesus, we live by the grace. <laughs> Saved by grace. By God's grace, sinners are saved and reborn into the family of God. God offers eternal life to all those who believe in his son, Jesus. Through Jesus Christ's substitutionary death on the cross, God pronounces not guilty. All who repent, confess of their sins, and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. As sinners, we deserve to die in our sins, but God's grace gives us everlasting life through his son, Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 15, verse 11. We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Romans chapter 5, verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 to praise the to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in his beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins James chapter 4 verse 6 but he gives more grace therefore it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble John chapter 1 verse 16. For from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. His grace is sufficient for every need. God gives grace to those who are in need and who are humble. Come to him for help. His grace supplies us with the power to serve, preach the gospel, and endure suffering, persecution, and hardship. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. So remember that when you're going through trials and and tribulations and testing, you know that that weakness is when you're going to get the most strength and understanding and guidance and protection. It's part of the process. We all go through it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. 
to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I love it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 11. 9 and 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, be deceived. Neither fornicators nor adulterers ad, 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 or adulterers. <laughs> Let me just start again. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 11. 9 through 11, excuse me. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, nor fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Sorry for messing that up. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. 1 Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us unto the kingdom of his Son and his love, in whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 If we confess with our if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 My little children these things I write to you so that you may not sin and if anyone sins we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous and he himself is a propitiation of our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. I want to pray for you men. I want you guys just to stay where you're seated. But I want you guys to make a decision tonight. I want you guys to ask yourself if you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I'm going to go into prayer. And then, you know, make sure you let everybody know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Because that's going to help motivate you to share the word. And that's a good step in the right direction when you receive Jesus to, to share that salvation and that redemption. And, and then all of a sudden your eyes are adjusted, you know. You ever wake up in the, in, the, in the morning and the lights turn on and it takes you a while to focus and see? That same light that you see in salvation through God's Son, Jesus Christ, is the same kind of fuzziness and fogginess we have in our lives. And maybe that's the reason why we don't change right away. It's a process. We're adjusting to a new light. We're walking in the light. We were walking in the darkness. Like zombies. We were dead. And so we're no longer going to be dead. Because we're going to pray now. And uh, it's, it's God's will. So, you know, all I can do is plant the seed. And I hope you guys will, will want to receive him. I got a whole case of Bibles up here. When we're done praying, you guys come up here and get a Bible. It's got the Old and New Testament in it. And then... Uh, I hope to be here again and, and preach in front of you guys. And uh, let me also tell you, too, I'm never talking at you. I'm talking with you. You know, we're family. We're brothers. You know, this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this in a peaceful way. And, and I don't want uh, any hard feelings because I love you. I do just about anything for you. And I know that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And I want you to know that I was in the darkness and I don't want you to be in the darkness anymore. And uh, that's the only thing I'm trying to do here. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, please bless our minds, our bodies, our hearts, and our souls. And please continue to give us the grace, strength, peace, mercy, and love we need to endure the pilgrimage to your kingdom. Heavenly Father, as, you, as I know you're present here with us this evening, that you'll lift us up in, in your word and allow us to understand the truth and the meaning of the scriptures and how the Bible 
is very, very relevant, and it will be the only thing that stands for all of eternity. It's uh, in Corinthians. Everything will fade away but the Bible, the truth, the love. Love is forever, and that's what this Bible is. It's a love story. You wrote it to us, and it's just an amazing thing. Lord, if it's your will, come into these men's lives. Transform their lives. Let them walk on a path of peace and understanding, guidance and protection in and through your son, Jesus Christ, held in an awesome relationship with you, with the Holy Spirit, and how we can walk in a way that we never walked before. We can never understand what this all meant. Let us understand now, tonight, how crucial it is to start this journey with you. I don't know how quick you'll work in these men's lives, but I know that if they come to you sincerely, that that work will begin. And if that work begins, you also promise in the Bible that any work you begin, you will see it to completion. And that we need to keep looking for the light and the darkness in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. In your heavenly name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Yes, sir.